How did you first meet Bruno? Because uh, I know you were an amateur wrestler, right? Well, yeah, I, mean, I wanted to be a pro. So I started wrestling in Pennsylvania, I had an early program. You can, I started in eighth grade. And then I wrestled in the high school as state champion. And when I was 16, I got my driver's license and my first piece of crap car. I found out through my mother, who did some volunteer work at the church, Bruno's address, because this kid went to this school. So I had Bruno's address, and once in a while when I went that direction, I'd go out of my way a little bit, because Bruno only lived a few miles down the road from me. And I'd go off the main little road, down a side road, which led right past Bruno's house and back. And where was that? I don't think you've actually In the North Hills of Pittsburgh. Okay. And so I, I would like, drive by his house once in a while. And one day during the summer, I was driving by his house and he has this big giant row of hedges on the side. And you can hardly see through them. But for a second, I caught a glimpse of Bruno standing by his pool getting a suntan. And I remember I went, oh my God, there he is. I mean, my hero. It was like, it was like seeing Superman in real life. Or, I mean, it was, you know, my, my hero was standing right there. And I don't know what came over me, because I'm 16 years old, little zit-faced kid. And I stopped the car, and I got out, but I'm on the side, like I, you know, you'd have to walk around the whole house to get to the gate. So I didn't know what to do, so I started crawling through the hedges. And I <laughs> crawled through the hedges, and I'm making this racket, and as my head's popping through the other side of the hedges, I can see Bruno turning and he goes, what in the hell is coming through my hedges? And here comes this, you know, kid, this fan, and I'm surprised he kept a straight face because he's like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> but here come, and, and I was very polite, oh, Mr. San Martino, and he was very polite, very nice, you know, guy. And, and covered uh, in scratches and everything. Yeah, I got <laughs> thorns on me and leaves and, you know, my hair's all messed up with twigs in it. And I, you know, that's how it started. I introduced myself, I was very humble, and he was very nice, and told him this is my dream, and, and, and we talked, and I'm not really sure, that. I don't remember exactly, but then I think he said, well, if you see me in my you know, backyard sometime, you know, stop by, we'll talk, and we talked a couple times, and he was impressed by my amateur wrestling thing. But then we started, to, to take a long, longer story short, but then we started working out in his basement, because right. he had weights, and I did his, you know, workout, and that's why I kind of resembled him, because I did the same workout he did, which was a lot of heavy chest. I mean, when I weighed 240 in his basement, I benched uh, 465 and a half pounds. You know, I guess his own son of, would have been a kid at this point. Yeah, so, yeah. The, the one son was, you know, yay big, and then the two twins were babies. So you do your weight workouts together? Yeah, so I started working out with him in his basement, getting him looking. He, you know, would help me get in and smarten me up to the psychology, which is kind of a lost art today. What was his strength like in those days? Oh, he, even in those days, uh, at one time he held the record, the bench press record at 565. Right. But at that time he only weighed 265 pounds. Later that record was broken, but the guy who broke it weighed like 500 and some pounds and in those days probably gassed to yeah. the gills. In Bruno's day, when I started, you never even heard of that stuff. Right. That came in you know, the generation, the, the next generation later. And he was very against that. And yeah, he was very against it because the guys who were getting looked at were these guys that looked ridiculous, but they didn't love the business, they weren't wrestlers, some of them weren't even good athletes, they just looked the ridiculous. The of the world. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they, they had that surrealistic look that Hollywood was getting into, but in terms of being a talent and a wrestler, they sucked. So that's what the part Bruno hated it. The legitimate athletes got kind of overlooked for the guys that would do that, you know. Would he ever smarten you up to the business in those days? When you it took young? a while before he started smartening me up. Did you, you, you must have suspected it, I guess. I hoped it was, because I didn't want to get beat up by these big scary bastards. So what led to your actual uh, debut in wrestling? I guess he was the only one that trained you, I suppose. Well, Bruno was training me, and then there was a guy named Guido Mongol. Oh, God. Wasn't he partnered New with... Newt Tatry. Uh, okay. He was partners with Joe Beppo. Wasn't one of Demolition involved in that at one point? At maybe one point, but there was a guy before him. Okay. Who's Beppo. 
Even Nikolai Volkov. Nikolai, yeah. yeah. Nikolai and Beppo, yeah, they were the first models. Okay. But Bruno owned a little territory of Pittsburgh. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, see, the, the WWF had all their stuff, but Pittsburgh was Bruno's town, and he ran Pittsburgh, on, you know, and then some little high schools on the weekends. So the Civic Arena was his? Yeah. Area. So I got my first matches in Bruno's little territory, like in little high schools in the middle of nowhere. It would still have 3,000 people in them in those days. And, and that's how I kind of learned under the radar. Uh, I was asked earlier uh, about the guys I've wrestled in my career. And uh, of course, I, I, I wrestled Luthez, and I wrestled uh, just about everyone out there. I wrestled the Crusher. I wrestled uh, Harley Race. I wrestled Jack and Jerry Briscoe. And uh, after uh, Bruno had retired, pretty much, he was doing TV commentary, then he left WWE, and I won the belt from Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, and then uh, Ricky decided he wanted time off to go away and, and, and everything. So the substitute for the matches at Madison Square Garden, Boston, Chicago, Miami, Detroit, uh, the list went on and on. It was Bruno. And I was so excited to have matches with Bruno. And the buildings were all sold out, turnaway crowds. In fact, in Boston Garden, we only had two weeks, two weeks to promote the fact that Bruno was going to take me on for the Intercontinental Championship. And we had a turnaway crowd there. And I was excited. I was like a kid in the candy store to be able to wrestle Bruno. And we had some fabulous matches. In fact, the, if you go on YouTube, you can look up a, a couple of them. One of them in particular was in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at the Spectrum. The crowd was so big that when we were walking to the ring, and if you look it up on YouTube and you'll know that I'm not filling you full of nonsense, uh, we had escort with the police and you could hardly get through the crowd. It was so big, but... Uh, the, and the matches were fun, and I enjoyed every one of them. Every time I see Bruno now, we talk about how 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 the matches went so smooth because he didn't want to come back and and be in the ring with someone that uh, that he didn't know or wasn't trained properly, and uh, he was a little bit apprehensive. But he enjoyed uh, wrestling me, and I enjoyed wrestling him. With the death of uh, Bruno San Martino, uh, would you mind talking about him a bit? And yeah. If I was uh, back in Bruno's heyday, I was there uh, when he had his second run. And if I was uh, from another planet and landed, and I've I've seen all the champions from Thez. I didn't see him when he was champion, but I had the pleasure of being a six-man tag with him one time with Jersey Joe Walcott as a Special referee who was the world heavyweight boxing champion. I've seen Briscoe, I've seen Funk, I've, both Funks, I've seen uh, Harley, I've seen Record Course, Steamboat, on and on and on. <clears throat> and like I said, if I had landed in the world and the first time I went to a wrestling match, I would know Bruno was a world champion. The way he carried himself, the way he looked, he was the epitome of what a wrestler should look like. You know, you train constantly, he was, and you know how people exaggerate what they can lift. Bruno did a 560 pound bench press back in the day. No wraps, no suit, nothing. Uh, so. With a suit and wraps, I would say he would have done 700 pounds. Uh, he had, a lot of people knocked Bruno's wrestling ability. He, I saw him have a match one time on TV with Baron Cicluna, when Baron was, career was winding down. And they did, uh, back in the day, a Southern style match high spots, arm drags, very little healing from Cicluna. And they went about 15 minutes on TV, which was a rarity for Bruno to wrestle on TV. And when Bruno made a comeback, uh, he made a comeback. I just read something that I, I, I almost question the validity of it. 
He sold out the gardens 180 times. That's something to say. And all the, the length of time that he held the title, it was over 4,000 days. I mean, he was a special athlete. And people say, well, he only drew in the Northeast. That's crazy because he went to San Francisco when Ray Stevens was red hot and he wrestled. They did a great angle. He wrestled Ray Stevens. And Ray was the U.S. champion out there. And Ray beat him on a count out. And the thing was, in uh, California at the time, in Shire's territory, if you got counted out of the ring, you lost. So technically, Ray Stevens was the WWF champion for a moment until the WWF came down and said, your title doesn't change on a uh, count out or disqualification. He also went to Montreal, and Killer Kowalski was a dear friend of mine. Kowalski told me that Bruno put him over in the middle of the ring. This was between Bruno's run as champion. So people saying that he didn't do jobs is not true. He also made New, uh, New not New Japan, All Japan Wrestling with Baba. He was a very close friend of Baba. He went over there and they did 60 minutes numerous times. And you being the athlete you are, you know 60 minutes is a long time. And with a guy like Baba, it's even longer. And that's no discredit to Baba because Baba was at the tail end of his career, or at least uh, he was on the downslide. And Bruno made all Japan wrestling. And how did you end up going to New York for the, the first time there? Well, I, uh, well, like I said, I, I went into uh, New, uh, t to Dallas, and yeah. uh, that's Red Bastine and everything, and a guy named Mike Pedusis, an old-timer from Steubenville, Ohio, who was good friends with Bruno, was living in Dallas, and uh, uh, he hung around the wrestling business. He, you know, he, he wasn't wrestling anymore, but he, he came and he saw me, and I guess he, he ended up saying, hey, you know, he liked my style or something, and so he called Bruno, and then Bruno ended up, Bruno was always probably looking for somebody, you know, somebody new to work against, you know, and somebody fresh, so, uh, Anyway, Bruno called me, and then Bruno called uh, Vince, and then Vince called me, and so, you know, Red Bastine was uh, really nice as a booker. I was I was involved a little bit. I was the, like the number two guy. The Stomper was the number one guy in the Dallas territory, and Jim J.J. Dillon was his manager, and they were the top for sure, the top heel. And then I was kind of like the number two guy, but. You know, I knew exactly where I was, and I liked that, you know. And, uh, but anyway, so Red Bastine gave me my blessings and said, hey, hey, go on, you know, and uh, I appreciate, you know, him probably giving me a good word. And anyway, that's how I got there, Mike Bedusas. So it was planned from the start that you were going to have the matches with Bruno? Well, I don't know if it's planned. I yeah. mean, that was the way that the system worked in yeah. the old WWF, you know. Uh, Bruno was the champion, and they would bring in different, you know, top guys. And I was not a top, you know, I wouldn't consider that, you know, a top guy. But they had uh, Bruno was working when they brought me in. He was working with superstar Billy Graham, Ernie Ladd, and Ivan Koloff. I mean, three of the top top heels in the whole country at the time. So they, you know, you you went through that, and uh, they were. So at the time I came in and I ended up working against uh, Bruno, uh, they were through working, you know, the way the system was, uh, they were through working with Bruno in the garden, but they were still going to be working with him in Pittsburgh and Boston and Philly. And so all those guys, you know, you'd work all the way around the whole territory. And we've done a few interviews with Billy Graham, so I'll just bring it up. Uh, what were your memories of knowing him over the years? Uh... Well, you know, he, uh, he, he, 
he was he was like a the top guy, you know. I mean, uh, he was one of the top guys that I was following, and uh, you know, I ended up hurting Bruno. So you know, I mean, uh, I slammed him on the back of his neck and broke his neck, and you know, he was uh, luckily it, it didn't have any kind of nerve damage, but it it did hurt him, and he was out, and so Billy Graham and. Lad and all those guys, you know, and Koloff, they didn't get a chance to finish their run, right? So it cost me, cost them a lot of money, you know, that they they should have been making. So, but they never outwardly ever ever held it against me, you know, and uh, things like that happened. But I'm sure I, I cost them a lot. And, and you mentioned the uh, breaking Bruno's neck. Uh, did Bruno hold it, any type of uh, animosity towards you over he that? He never showed that and to this day. You know, he's just been the classist act. And, uh, you know, we had a chance here lately to touch base with each other at the, at the uh, uh, WrestleMania in Dallas. And uh, you know, we got a chance to... My family got to meet and meet and meet him and everything, and he he's just been a class class act. And I mean, he gave me some good advice. He said, "Don't stay around forever, you know, and and get beat down, you know. <laughs> so you know you can come back." And so I kept that, and that and I kept that advice to me, and and uh, followed it, and it uh, got heat with the, some of the the higher ups of. Uh, the WWWF at the time because, you know, I wanted to maybe come back and work against Bruno against, and, uh, you know, so I, I followed his advice. What was the Shea Stadium match like with uh, with Bruno? Because that was such a huge event at the time. Yeah, it was, you know. Uh, you know, they, of course, it was a combination of, uh, you know, Muhammad Ali and, uh, you know, uh, Inoki, and then, uh, uh, Andre fought Chuck Wetner, you know, here in, in New York, and then I, you know, Bruno came back from his broken neck, you know, against uh, against me, and uh, so they closed circuited that all all around the United States. I guess they, you know, in different territories in the NWA and everything. But I heard only 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 in the the Vince's territory that uh, did it really draw any kind of money, and uh, mainly it was. To see Bruno come back, it wasn't to see Stan Hansen or anything. It was, it was to see Bruno come back, and uh, it was it was a uh, it was quite impressive, and uh, yeah, people were you know really excited to see Bruno come back. They hadn't done a stadium show in that territory for a while, I don't think before that. You know, I heard that they had done something one before with Pedro Morales and somebody in New Jersey, or uh, you know, I don't know where it was, but. Uh, but anyway, uh, this was Shea Stadium. Of course, it's gone. But uh, you know, it's uh, it was you know, about forty thousand people or something. I guess I I, I, I can't remember. But uh, it was it was good, and and they closed circuited it all around their territory, and evidently it did good there too. After that 1975 first run for about a year, I guess it was maybe a year and a half. Then I went back to Phoenix and uh, had a uh, kind of a hiatus period. I got another phone call from Vince at the gym I was training at. He said, Billy, good to talk to you again. He said, this is Vince Sr. I said, Vince, good to hear your voice again. What's going on? What's happening? He said, listen, Bruno's tired. Bruno's worn out. The wrestling rings in the New York Territory were like boxing rings. They were hard as a carpet that we're sitting on right now. They were boxing rings. They had no give, no give to them. And, and Vince said, Bruno is tired. He's worn out, he's beat up, and he wants to retire. He wants, he, doesn't want to, he wants to work a little bit, but he doesn't want to work the full-time schedule, and he wants to drop the, drop the strap. And he says, I think you'd be perfect to take the strap. And he said, and then he said, but, I, but I'm, I've got a guy named Bob Backlund that I'm in the process of training and preparing to take Bruno's spot permanently. You will be an interim champion from this date, the exact date he gave me to take the strap, take the belt, to the exact date 
that I would surrender and give up the belt back to back them. It was just short of a year, 11 months, 10 and a half months, something like that. So anyway, I said, that's great. That's fantastic. I'd be, I'd be, be glad to, happy to. So we did it, and we did it in Baltimore. Why did we do it in Baltimore when all the title changes happened in New York Madison Square Garden? Well, Vince Sr. was the mastermind behind that. He said, it's time that we do it in another city to catch the fans off guard. Well, when I walked into Baltimore, April 30th, 1977, there's all these cameras and these scaffolding, which were never there before in the city. And Vince Jr. sitting ringside and all the TV crew. And so <laughs> it's kind of obvious something's going to happen here tonight. You know, I'm, I'm the main event against Bruno. And, and we have cameras that for the first time ever. Cameras were set up in Baltimore. And I said, I think the fans might kind of catch on to what's going on here. But it didn't matter. It didn't matter at all. And so, sure enough, we, uh, we made the exchange in Baltimore, and it was a living hell getting out of that ring when I took that belt from Bruno and had cheated by putting my feet. And Vince McMahon Sr. insisted, not only do I put my feet on the ropes to cheat, but I put my feet on the top turnbuckle so every fan in the house knew that I cheated to beat Bruno for the belt. Usually you don't put your feet on the top turnbuckle if you're going to pin somebody and use the rope for leverage. This is the second turnbuckle maybe, or the first one or the second. He said, you put your feet on the top turnbuckle. And so you go back in history and look at the still photographs or the video, and you'll see my feet... And I was bleeding heavily because I felt the least I could do for Bruno San Martino is bleed for the man because he's surrendering the, the, the belt, this priceless belt to me. And so I'm going to show gratitude for him and just cut my head open and, and bleed half to death in honor of him sur surrendering the belt to me. And man, I put my feet on the top rope and, and when that referee counted three, all hell broke loose. When they realized that it was for real. And I rolled over, and I, and I got up, and the referee came over and raised my hand. And I had that iconic still photograph. I may not have said it to you yet, but I will. Of the referee with my hand raised, with the belt in my hand, and the blood pouring down my body. And the fans... The fans absolutely were in a frenzy. You're supposed to turn the house lights on in between matches so you can see to get out because it's very dark in Baltimore. You look at the, the still photos and some of the, some of the video, the lamp type things over the ring, very dark arena. And man, the, the, the guy that's supposed to <laughs> turn the house lights on was watching the deal. He got so into it, he forgot to turn the house lights on. So it's dark. And I'm and I'm trying to get out of the ring, and all the fans close off the the aisle. It's just little ropes anyway, around cement, little barriers, and the fans close off the exit row. So I, I rolled the belt up around this right hand, and it had about this much belt showing, and pouring blood. And I said, I got to get out of this ring, and I stepped out. And I started swinging that belt, man, like a, like a helicopter blade. And I whacked people. I mean, I hit people with the belt. And people were hitting me. People were kicking me. People were throwing things at me, chairs. It was, like a, it was like a riot trying to get out of that ring. I never had felt that type of intensity in my entire life. Trying to get back to the locker room, I had to fight my way all the way back. All the way, getting kicked getting punched, getting hit with, I think they were selling bottles of beer at the time, <laughs> not even cups, chairs, everything, everything imaginable, little old ladies with fighting, <laughs> figuring out final things, reaching through, stabbing you. And so it was absolute chaos and pandemonium. The word pandemonium really comes into play here. Pure pandemonium broke loose. 
And I finally got back to the locker room, showered off, got the blood off me, threw my stuff in the bag, cleared out of there. I said, thank you, Bruno, brother. I got to beat the crowd, man. He says, I'll see you, superstar. And, of course, that was the first match after the admission. There was like five more matches, so, and a battle royal to follow the whole of the crowd so I could get out of the building. And I ran out of the back door, grabbed the first cab I got, man, it was gone. Uh, you went back to WWWF and had a few with uh, Bruno, Bruno San Martino. San Martino yeah, I uh, every couple of years back. What was your thoughts on Bruno San Martino? He's such a legendary uh, guy. Well, Bruno San Martino is one of the best uh, wrestler I ever lived, in my opinion. <clears throat> he sold out Mr. Square Garden, uh, you know, more than any other performer, uh, even singer or uh, hockey or anybody. He sold out about 118 times. Wow. His life continued. He was a champion uh, for 11 years. And I read that you had something like six Madison Square Garden sellouts with you. Yes, oh yeah. I was the first one every time I worked against Bruno San Martino, I sold it out. And were you surprised after all the years that Bruno uh, had that feud with WWE, he was very bitter towards the company. Were you surprised that he had a total turn of face and is now well, in the Hall of Fame? Bruno San Martino, I will show you something. Oh, Here's right. a Bruno San Martino, 80 years old, on this picture. How does he look to you? He looks like he... Can you get it on the camera? Of, uh, 80 years old. No. Body of but, a 20 year old. But he never did drugs. Yeah. Never did any drugs, always work out. You keep clean, and that's why I respect him. All right. Do you still remain friends with him? Oh yes, I still remain friends, yeah. Matter of fact, uh, we was together on last WrestleMania and WrestleMania before that. Yeah. He's now back with, uh, with the WWF, yeah. he come there, behind scenes stuff. And so, Vince made uh, love him because Vince McMahon know that Bruno is one of the greatest wrestlers. Did you always think that he would eventually make up with them, or were you surprised? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Because you cannot kill, uh, you cannot keep. Uh, we call uh, that animosity. I guess. Animosity all your life. Not good for you. It's not good for your health. <laughs> and uh, speaking of Bruno San Martino, he was uh, defeated by uh, Billy Graham, Billy who Graham, we've yeah. done a lot of interviews with. Yeah. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are on uh, Superstar. Well, Billy Graham, Billy Graham was uh, at that time. He was a good-looking wrestler. A right, good looking wrestler, was a good guy, but uh, he did not come the same way as Bruno San Martino. He used, uh, I don't want to talk about the guy, bad habits, you know what I mean? But then, uh, today he's in bad shape, put it yeah. this way, I make it short, short and sweet. You were good friends with uh, Bruno San Martino dating back to your youth. Um, what are your thoughts on his recent passing? Well, I, I was. Uh, Really, really sad. In fact, I traveled with Davey O'Hannon uh, from New Jersey all the way across Pennsylvania to Pittsburgh to uh, be there for his service. And I talked to his wife uh, on the phone many times, but never met her in person. I saw Baron Seclunas' son and his wife. Uh, Dominic Danucci was there. And it's just, Bruno was so kind to me when I was young and in college, and and he was already established. and, and at that point, it wasn't like he was kind to me because I was going to be able to do something for him. It just showed the kind of person that he was. And uh, it was one of those trips that was a difficult trip to make, but uh, one of those trips I, I had to make to, to pay my last respects. How did you first meet Bruno? Because uh, I know you were an amateur wrestler, right? Well, yeah, I, mean, I wanted to be a pro. So I started wrestling in Pennsylvania. I had an early program. You can, I started in eighth grade. And then I wrestled in the high school as state champion. And when I was 16, I got my driver's license and my first piece of crap car. I found out through my mother, who did some volunteer work at the church, Bruno's address, because his kid went to the school. So I had Bruno's address, and once in a while when I went that direction, I'd go out of my way a little bit, because Bruno only lived a few miles down the road from me. And I go off the main little road down a side road, which led right past Bruno's house and back. And where up. was that? I don't think you've actually been. In the North Hills of Pittsburgh. Okay. And so I, I would like, drive by his house once in a while. And one day during the summer, I was driving by his house, and he has this big giant row of hedges on the side. And you could hardly see through them. But for a second, I caught a glimpse of Bruno standing by his pool 
getting a suntan. And I remember I went, oh my God, there he is. I mean, my hero, it was like, it was like seeing Superman in real life. Or, I mean, it was, you know, my, my hero was standing right there. And I don't know what came over me, because I'm 16 years old, little zit face kid. And I stopped the car, and I got out, but I'm on the side, like I, you know, you'd have to walk around the whole house to get to the gate. So I didn't know what to do, so I started crawling through the hedges. And I <laughs> crawled through the hedges, and I'm making this racket, and as my head's popping through the other side of the hedges, I can see Bruno turning, and he goes, what in the hell is coming through my hedges? And here comes this, you know, kid, this fan, and I'm surprised he kept a straight face, because he's like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> but here come, and, and I was very polite, oh, Mr. San Martino, and he was very polite, very nice, you know, guy. And, and covered uh, in scratches and everything. Yeah, I got <laughs> thorns on me, and leaves, and, you know, my hair's all messed up, with twigs in it. And I, you know, that's how it started. I introduced myself, I was very humble, and he was very nice, and told him this is my dream, and, and, and we talked, and I'm not really sure, I don't remember exactly, but then I think he said, well, if you see me in my, you know, backyard sometime, you know, stop by, we'll talk, and we talked a couple times, and he was impressed by my amateur wrestling thing. But then we started, to, to take a long, longer story short, but then we started working out in his basement, because right. he had weights, and I did his, you know, workout, and that's why I kind of resembled him, because I did the same workout he did, which was a lot of heavy chest. I mean, when I weighed 240 in his basement, I benched uh, 465 and a half pounds. You know, I guess his only son of, would have been a kid at this point. Yeah, so, yeah. The, the one son was, you know, yay big, and then the two twins were babies. So you do your weight workouts together? Yeah, so I started working out with them in his basement, getting them looking. He, you know, would help me get in and smarten me up to the psychology, which is kind of a lost art today. What was his strength like in those days? Oh, he, even in those days, uh, at one time he held the record, the bench press record at 565. Right. But at that time he only weighed 265 pounds. Later that record was broken, but the guy who broke it weighed like 500 and some pounds and in those days probably gassed to yeah. the gills. In Bruno's day, when I started, you never even heard of that stuff. Right. That came in you know, generation, the, the next generation later. And he was very against that. And yeah, he was very against it because the guys who were getting looked at were these guys that looked ridiculous, but they didn't love the business, they weren't wrestlers, some of them weren't even good athletes, they just looked the ridiculous. Of the world. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they, they had that surrealistic look that Hollywood was getting into, but in terms of being a talent and a wrestler, they sucked. So that's what the part Bruno hated, it. and the legitimate athletes got kind of overlooked for the guys that would do that, you know. Would he ever smarten you up to the business in those days? When you it took young? a while before he started smartening me up. Did you, you, you must have suspected it, I guess. I hoped it was, because I didn't want to get beat up by these big scary bastards. So what led to your actual uh, debut in wrestling? I guess he was the only one that trained you, I suppose. Well, Bruno was training me, and then there was a guy named Guido Mongol. Oh, God. Wasn't he partnered New with... New Tatry. Uh, okay. He was partners with Joe Beppo. Wasn't one of Demolition involved in that at one point? At maybe one point, but there was a guy before him. Okay. Who's Beppo. Even Nikolai Volkov. Nikolai, yeah. yeah. Nikolai and Beppo, they, they were the first Mongols. Okay. But Bruno owned a little territory of Pittsburgh. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, see, the WWF had all their stuff, but Pittsburgh was Bruno's town, and he ran Pittsburgh on, you know, and then some little high schools on the weekends. So something. the Civic Arena was his? Yeah. Uh, so I got my first matches in Bruno's little territory, like in little high schools in the middle of nowhere. It would still have 3,000 people in them in those days. And, and that's how I kind of learned under the radar. Are you friends with Bruno? Yes, I just saw him last week. He's only about 18 miles from my house. Are you uh, surprised after so many years of a conflict with WWE that he's now back on good terms with the company? Uh, if you know, if you knew what I know, you were not surprised. Because Vince has screwed him on many, many occasions. Okay? Uh, but then the fans, the wrestling fans, 
the sent a letter and they called why Bruno San Martino for so many years. Because there's no man in the world will do like what Bruno did in New York. Hey, for years. Bruno was like a superstar in that time, okay? But Vince McMahon, the father, he um, didn't treat him right. Okay? So this thing, what happened with the Hall of Fame, always say, well, some people say, he, got, he made that for money. Yeah, the money is number one sometimes. I don't care who you so are. He, so he probably got to get some of money for... Uh, well, because, of what he, because Vince McMahon was selling the thing, he didn't make no money on it. Right. So then they got the chance, and they took the advantage. I would do the same thing. <laughs> okay? And you would often wrestle the same opponents as Bruno, wouldn't you? Either on their way up or on the way down after they wrestled Bruno or before? Oh, I wrestled with all the guys. All the ones you can think about. What were, your, uh, what were your memories of Superstar Billy Grimm? Uh, he was not a, the best wrestler in the world. He was not. He had good body. Fine. But if you talk about wrestling, wrestling, okay? Uh, you can't compare with, with the wrestler. He was a nice man, but he was always trying to take a shortcut. Yeah. But he draws some money. And that's for the promoter. If you don't draw no money, you're nothing. Okay? One of the, my great moments that, that in the International Sports Hall of Fame was when we had Arnold Schwarzenegger on stage, Franco Colombo, you know, his training partner, whatever, and Bruno Sammartino. These three guys had not seen each other over 45 years till they put them on the stage together. They had not seen each other in 45 years when they were training in the gym. You imagine the human dynamics, and Triple H is there at the same time, Mark Henry is there at the same time, and so you have Randy Couture, and you've got a number of generations all together, and you've got these three legendary icons, Bruno who filled Madison Square Garden more than anybody else, including Frank Sinatra, Arnold who's Arnold, Franco who's one of the you know, world's strong men and, and Mr. Olympia, and these three icons seeing each other after 45 years and to be responsible for making that happen, I mean, you know, and then having all these other guys, you know, like a Triple H and a Mark Henry and a Randy Couture in that same room together, and that's what we try to create we keep it tight, we only keep a small number of people in the room. So you have 100 members of the international press, and then you got 100 icons in the room. So even the icons don't know who to run to because they're so excited because it's not one sport, it's all these different sports. Now you're talking about Bruno San Martino. He passed away, I believe it was yeah. last year or yeah. the year before. And he was in, he looked to be in great shape. Uh, what are your thoughts on his passing? Well, I mean, Bruno was, uh, the first time I met Bruno, I was a kid, I was 17 years old. He was being inducted into the World Bodybuilding Guild Hall of, Hall of Fame, which I ended up going in a few years later. His class was Jack Lane, Bill Pearl, and him. And I'm there as a, you know, like an 18-year-old kid seeing these three guys, like, just starstruck. I mean, it's like, wow. And uh, Bruno, and, and one of the nicest, most gentle, um, modest guys you'd ever want to meet. Uh, it's a great loss, you know, for all of us with him, but I was so happy that we recognized him, and then just right after that he got recognized by the WWE in a massive ceremony in front of 50,000 people. A very deserving guy and just he's a legend. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates. Follow us on Twitter at The Hannibal TV for instant updates.